The title for One Bullet Away came most directly from a quote from my old commanding officer. He said that each of us in the company was one bullet away from command. And I always felt that way in the Marines, that each of us was one hair's breadth away from having to step up to the plate. Less directly, it's also about the relativity of safety, something I had a hard time explaining to my family and friends at home when I was in Iraq and Afghanistan, was that it wasn't necessarily as dangerous as they thought. We in the United States tend to think Iraq is a dangerous place. But when you're in Iraq, some streets are dangerous and some aren't. And then when you're on a certain street, one side may be dangerous and the other one's not. Taking it all the way down to the micro level, I mean, if you're standing next to a wall, you can be in a perfectly safe spot, and then you step two feet away, and you get killed. So at any given point, you're one bullet away, sort of walking that razor's edge between uh, safety and danger. And then it's also about a phenomenon that my platoon used to talk about a lot. We'd get through a firefight, and people would wonder, you know, why some got hit and some didn't. How is it that we had 40 bullet holes in a Humvee and nobody inside got hit? The Marines came up with a term for this. They said it was the sacred geometry of chance. The idea that the difference between life and death out there is one of seconds and millimeters. And I, I liked that phrase, the sacred geometry of chance. For me, it really summed up that idea that we're all existing here, you know, hanging by a very fine thread. All of those things together really resonated for me in the phrase, one bullet away. There's a line in the audiobook where I say every Marine thinks he's the toughest guy in the room. Let's be honest about it. People don't join the Marines for college money or to learn a skill. People tend to join the Air Force or the Navy to do that, maybe even the Army. Uh, people join the Marines, or at least I joined the Marines, because the Marine Corps didn't make any promises except to give me a hard transformative experience. Recon's the most elite unit within the Marine Corps. When the U.S. formed the Special Operations Command back in the early 80s, Recon was invited to join, but the Marine Corps declined, saying they didn't want any special Marines. In uh, the eyes of the Corps' leadership, all Marines were equal. So now, 20 years later, Recon's not technically part of the Special Operations Command, but Recon Marines go through much of the same training, parachuting, scuba diving, um, evasion, resistance to torture and interrogation, these sorts of things. So these are many of the most experienced Marines in the Corps. I commanded an infantry platoon in Afghanistan, and the average age in that platoon was maybe 20 years old. The average age of my recon platoon was closer to 30. I, as the commander, was one of the younger guys in the platoon. So you end up with a platoon of very experienced, mature Marines who are better equipped to operate independently and do things on their own, make big picture decisions on their own. I tried out for recon for the same reason I joined the Marines. I wanted to be with the best. And I'd watched a recon platoon in Afghanistan, and their commander, a guy named Eric Dill, invited me to take his place at recon when we were coming home. And it reminded me, actually, of a poster I'd seen when I was thinking about joining the Marines. In the recruiter's office, there was a poster that said, superior thinking has always overwhelmed superior force. And that to me is what recon's all about. When a recon team does its job well, they don't fire a shot. It's about finesse, it's about intelligence. And that's not to say they're not able to you know, put the smack down if they have to, but that's never the goal. The Marines had this sort of Hollywood reputation of being very rigid and very hierarchical, almost tyrannical in how they approach problems. But my experience was that it's actually a more egalitarian service. And another aspect of One Bullet Away is the fact that there's a whole lot of equality within a ground unit in combat. I, as the commander, was right up there, you know, sticking my head up along with the lowliest private. I think that that forges a special kind of bond inside a platoon, an infantry platoon or a marine recon platoon, because everyone, regardless of rank, regardless of their job, is facing that danger shoulder to shoulder together. And every one of them is one bullet away from the great beyond.
Many of the other services, especially the Army, decorate their uniforms with all sorts of badges and pins and decorations to show where that particular soldier or airman or sailor has been, what his qualifications are. But the Marines tend to have uh, much more austere uniforms. We didn't wear jump wings or scuba bubbles, these identifying markers on our uniforms. Recon Marines don't wear anything special that identifies them as Recon Marines. They really only have you know, two um, identifying marks on their uniforms. They have a name tape over one breast, and over the other they have a tape that says U.S. Marines, and that's considered enough. The Marines, as the name might suggest, are an amphibious force. And it's easy to forget these days. We see footage on CNN of soldiers and Marines interchangeably patrolling on these dusty streets or snowy mountains in Afghanistan. But the Corps is, at its heart, uh, an amphibious force. It's actually part of the Department of the Navy. A lot of recon's training is amphibious, either in boats or swimming. When I got to the unit, it was quickly identified that some of the swimming was one of my weaker points. And so the weakness, it was decided, would be beaten out of me. So I got thrown in the pool for a two-week course on water survival. The motto of the course was painted on this tower next to the pool. And in two-foot-high black block letters, it said, if you're still conscious, then you have quit. The idea being that you should keep struggling until you literally black out and sink to the bottom of the pool. And I came pretty close to that point, but... By the end of the two weeks, when I graduated, it really was true that that fear, that discomfort, had been beaten out of me. The terror was replaced with a calm and a knowledge that I could survive in the water no matter what. And there's a broader point there, that we all have a natural human tendency to train our strength. If you're a triathlete and you're good at running and you're really bad at biking and you're taking, you know, you're looking at going for an easy workout on Saturday, you're going to go for a run instead of a bike ride. And it's the same thing with the skills in recon. You need to face down the thing you're worst at. You need to face your greatest fear. They were very good at that when I arrived. And in time, I became good at doing that to newcomers behind me. Because at the end of the day, these are people you have to rely on under literally life or death circumstances. And you just can't afford to have people with a weakness, especially one that they have only because they've not had the courage or the discipline to face it. I found reading the book to be very much like the early writing of the book. When I first started writing, it was just after I'd left the Marines, and recording these experiences was still very emotional. There were literally times when I was crying over my computer keyboard. And as I went through subsequent revisions of the book, I was able to distance myself more from it emotionally and look at it more as craft and approach the words more objectively. But it was a surprise to me when I started reading that all of the immediacy, the emotional immediacy of that early writing came right back. And the spoken word is so different from the written word. I can write a sentence and let the reader interpret it as he or she will. But in speaking the sentence, the meaning has to be very precise. I know as a reader and a listener, I much prefer memoirs or first-person accounts that are read by the author because I feel like it's really a window into what the author felt, both living the experience and then writing about the experience. So I was excited when I was invited to read, but it really has been a challenge. It's hard to reopen these boxes and have to confront that emotion again. But I hope that ultimately it makes for a more three-dimensional experience in listening to the story. (laughs) ¶¶